Hello. Welcome to the MSC Final Show Exhibition. I'm very honored to present to you tonight a series of work which I believe represents the heart of what's happening at the Creative Computing Institute, which is a deep, profound understanding of creative AI and immersive environments and the way that critical thinking can be applied to those two spaces. With us tonight, we have the first cohort of students. This event will be running both tonight and tomorrow night, so make sure to come back. And you will be hearing their thesis talk, and you will be able to view their work both on uh, the Graduate Showcase site and also at creativecomputing.cci.arts.ac.uk. And you should be able to find that link uh, in YouTube to check out and see. This, without doubt, has been an honor for me. This year has been one of the best of my life. I have loved working with these students and watching them grow from initially coming in and some of them not knowing how to code at all to some extremely complicated and advanced computational thinking as well as that same caliber of art and design thinking has been just a, a beautiful process to watch. And I hope everyone here can really feel the excitement that we have for this cohort going out in the world and the changes they'll bring forth as a result of being embedded in practice environments, both at ad agencies and their independent art practice in galleries, museums, hopefully even perhaps maybe writers of books on creative technologies in the future. I want to invite you as well to leave messages or participate in the chat on YouTube. The students are here. They're watching the uh, the chat during their presentations and they will answer questions about their work if you would like to ask them. I will also be here. If you have any questions about the CCI or you're interested in coming to study with us, you can find me both in the comments and on the CCI website. So thank you so much and we're honored to have you and welcome. Without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Mick Grierson, who will talk a little bit about his experiences here and also about the importance of creative AI in the industry writ large. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Phoenix told me that um, uh, she thought it would be good if I said a few words and said, can you speak for like 15 minutes? Um, it seems like 15 minutes is a long time uh, <laughs> and there's quite a lot to say. Uh, and also it's really nice to be asked to talk. Um, and so I thought, what can I talk about for 15 minutes, which will be interesting. And I thought, well, you know, actually there's a lot to say. There's a huge amount to say about what this course has been like this year and what it means to be doing this course. And for those people, those of you who've taken the very first year of the MSC at the Creative Computing Institute, um, there's a massive amount to say about that, about the faith you placed in us, about the way we work together to solve problems and try out new ideas, about the amazing work that you've done and the way you've all approached everything that you've done. Um, the fact that we've had to work during coronavirus lockdown, which was completely unexpected. Um, it's been a very challenging year. It's been very, very difficult. But the work has just been absolutely supreme. All the way along, you know, me and Phoenix have been talking about the quality of the work that's been produced by you lot, you know, this cohort, and the way that you have approached everything that you've done. And it's been great. It's just been so good, particularly because it's been engaging with both the creative and the technical focus of what we've asked you to do. And that's just been remarkable. Both Phoenix and I have taught an awful lot of people. You know, I've taught thousands and thousands of developers over the years. And there are, in many ways, lots of reasons why I think that this group of students 
in this year, the 2019-2020 cohort of MSc Creative Computing students are pretty much the best students I think I've had the pleasure of working with. There are so many reasons. And I think that it's a real credit to you that you've been able to achieve that, to be so good in everything you've tried to do under such strange and improbable circumstances. It goes to show the excellence in terms of the choices that you've made and also in terms of the choices which you may go on to make and hopefully that's what will happen, that you'll continue to do these amazing things. You'll continue to do things that are difficult and challenging, but within your abilities as unique individuals. And what makes you unique is that you chose to do a course which is STEM and also arts. It's that, it's that combination that often gets called STEAM in the UK and elsewhere. But STEAM doesn't really explain what's going on properly, you know. It's not that we're taking arts ideas and using them in science and technology and engineering and maths, and it's not that we're taking STEM ideas and we're pushing them into what, you know, into an art context, although we're definitely doing both of those things. But that's not what's happening. That's not the reason for CCI. That's not what creative computing is. And that's not what you chose to do. And I think what's exciting and interesting about that is creative computing is a very different way of thinking about the value of computing technology. And that's the reason that we're doing it. It's because it's different, not for its own sake, but because there's a need, there's a need to do it. And I want to talk about that need because the next step for you is to enter either a research environment or a job market or a personal arts practice or some other pathway in life. And whatever it is you choose to do, you've got to remember that you have unique talents. You can do things other people wish they can do. You have an understanding, a unique understanding of both the computational and also the creative approaches that are needed by our societies now more than ever. You're one person where sometimes a whole team of people can't get it right. And the reason why one person can get it right is because you're the same person thinking about both problems from different directions. It's that whole approach, the synthesis. It's not about doing one thing in the other room or the other thing in the other room. It's about the synthesis of those approaches, the combination of those ideas. And that's where your power is going to come from. And that's where you'll provide value where other people can't provide value. And that's fundamentally what makes you unique and fundamentally what will get you hired where other people won't get hired. That's fundamentally what will make you succeed where other people can't succeed. And this is because of the kind of work that creative technology makes possible, right? For example, you know, AI and data science can solve big problems in how we interact with computers, for example, and it can unlock things about the natural world that maybe are more difficult for us to do on our own or even sometimes with large groups of people. But it's not always solving problems in the way computers are used or can be used to unlock human potential in other ways. And there are lots of important things about that. There are lots of things AI and data don't really do. In fact, that they may even cause problems for. Technology reinforces our desires, but not always our needs, right? Sometimes we do things because we think we want it, and then we get it and we think, actually, this isn't really what I want. And sometimes what we do is not always healthy for us, not always healthy for our societies, if we just focus on the technical need or what we imagine the technical need is without thinking about the human reality. Traditionally in computer science, questions of community and humanity and rights and values and purposes, they're not always uppermost in everyone's mind, right? And when they are, they're sometimes described in terms of morals or in terms of ethics. 
And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? For many, they're chiefly moral and ethical concerns, you know, issues of community, issues of humanity. But I'd argue that they are not only moral and ethical issues. Values and purposes are not only moral and ethical. I'd also say that they are economical, rigorous, sensible and necessary for a prosperous future. I'd say that governments and industry and research know this. They know this acutely. Uh, but they have to ignore it because the current systems don't allow them to operate in a way which can make this work. But community is essential for strong societies. Rights and values and purpose and the sense of consensus in terms of rights, values and purposes are essential. Also, vigorous debate is essential. You know, I'm not saying we need a homo homogenous approach. But the, the idea that these are only moral and ethical, idea, uh, moral and ethical um, uh, concepts is, is just not right, OK? It's across a great range of interactions in industry and in research and in education and elsewhere. And that's what makes CCI different, and that's what makes you different. We operate in a realm of computer science, sure. Our research and our enterprise and our education incorporates computer science principles, in many respects, and the knowledge that that brings is key to the way we empower ourselves as creatives. But more than this, CCI is driven by a very different set of impulses to those that dominate other computer science centres of excellence, places in the UK like Imperial or Oxford or Cambridge. Our chief application fields are not in general purpose computing, they're not in aerospace, they're not in space travel, they're not in economics or finance, but that doesn't mean that what you learn here isn't relevant in those fields. It certainly is, and mathematically, I think we've all come across this, that they're sometimes just the same problems, right? But the application fields we're operating in aren't intersecting, for example, with the military-industrial complex, and that's a conscious choice. That's a conscious choice. Instead, our approach is about creation. And I'm not talking about the anthropological sense of creativity as, as something that humans do. Because we know that's not right, you know. Creation isn't just about, oh, human ingenuity. It's not just about that. Animals can be creative. Creativity is not an easy thing to define, and I'm certainly not going to do it now. But the idea that it's been defined well by others is also incorrect. Particularly in, in fields like computing, definitions of creativity are sorely lacking and generally all complete nonsense. And we don't want to necessarily consider creative activity as something about, oh, you know, how a scientist works when they engage. They're creative, right? No, no. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe they are. But that's not the chief reason why we are studying creativity. Nor do we consider economic pro productivity to be the primary driver for the outcomes that our technology and our approaches point towards, right? It's not just about the economics. And this is despite the fact that we know economic productivity is hugely impacted by our work and what we do. We know the contribution of the creative industries is huge in terms of global economic reach. So, for example, in the UK, it's 101 billion in the UK economy every year, greater than 5% of the GVA output. 10% of all jobs in the UK are creative technology jobs, creative economy jobs, sorry. And a lot of those are in technology. UNESCO reports globally that the creative economy generated 2.25 trillion in revenue just, you know, in 2013 alone. And now that's much more. It's, at, I think, almost 20% more substantially more than telecommunications, which is only 1.57 trillion. The creative economy is generating almost twice as much in global telecommunications. I guess it depends how you count it, but this is according to UNESCO. So a substantial number of creative economy jobs are in creative technologies and about how we use technologies in the creative industries. And this is the important thing. We know that if we focus on the creative arts and creative industries, that we can increase areas and improve areas of life, increase productivity, sure. We can get better economic results, sure. But that's because what we're doing is about values. It's about 
perspectives. It's about creativity, not in the sense of human ingenuity, but in the sense of raw passion, beauty, aesthetics, and yeah, desire and love and all of those things which bring humans together and that make humans humans. Community, respect, consideration. And this is the way we consider computing. And this is the operational area and the application field of computing at a place like CCI. And this is the way you've been trained and the way we've tried to work together and with you and as a partnership because everything that we do is reflected in the way you are in what you do when you go out to the world and you do your thing and I don't mean to say that I mean in some ways some people would describe students of an institute as products and you're not just products you're ambassadors for a way of thinking you're ambassadors and pioneers for a completely different way of seeing how we can do computation in the outside world. And um, we're massively proud of you. I would just say a few more things about that. It's artists who were at the start of all digital revolutions. John Whitney picked up a military targeting computer on the side of the road and used it to create the very first computer animations. Daphne Oram used early embodied interaction approaches before anybody knew what they were to try to understand how to make electronic music instruments work using computer systems she designed herself way before anyone else in the world even thought about it. And this is what's critical. So with that in mind, I want to share with you some thoughts of people who I work with uh, in the industry and what they say they want where they say the skills gap is. We know there's a massive skills gap in creative tech. We know that it's generating all this money, but what is it that creative technologists who work in the industry say they're looking for? What do they want from you? What they want is, while it's stuff like this, this is, these are quotes, right? Direct quotes from people who work at Google, people who work at IBM, people who work across the industry, but mainly focused on creative techs. Uh, uh, people who work in places like WPP, people who work in, in advertising and creative industries, film, TV and music. And this is what they say. While hard programming skills are desirable to employers, they're not as urgently required as the ability to imaginatively and appropriately deploy skills. Employers want to recruit people who are flexible, curious, can acquire new skills quickly explore new ideas and understand them, understand their role in the process, rather than those who have a single narrow area of expertise. Industries and employers don't want people who come along and say, oh, I just do this. They want someone who's flexible, who is creative in the way they understand and focus on a brief. When you ask them about, you know, people in the job market, what the most important skills are, they say imagination, self-direction, you want to be able to originate your own ideas and use hard skills to achieve them. Creatives should drive technology. Versatility, curiosity about new skills are much more interesting than any form of extreme expertise. Technologists who are creative can hack with a machine learning API application in the morning and solder together a prototype after lunch. You know, that's a quote, a direct quote from what people expect. And they, that's, they're the kind of people that they're looking for. Research, and this is another thing about code quality, very specialist skills, you know, like research and production quality code are great, but a creative technologist should be above average at many things rather than specializing at being great at just programming or great at just design. And that's the kind of approach that we've tried to instill in you. Yes, you can all program. Yes, you can all design. Yes, you can do both. But also you can be flexible. You can represent people's perspectives. You can understand the needs of those people you're working with. You can create interactions that bring people together and you can understand the genuine productivity, and I don't mean economic productivity, the genuine productivity in creating beautiful things that change how people see the world and change the way we do things. So 
With that, I just want to say thanks for all the effort and the time that you've put into working with us over the last year and a half, year and a bit. We're massively proud of you. Again, I think you're going to do incredible jobs, each and every one of you, in an area where there needs to be more people like you. You know, doing computing in these contexts, it's not just about making great films or movies or artworks or touring exhibitions. It's about changing how people see computation and opening and unlocking the door to entirely different ways of seeing the world and benefiting humanity through an engagement with those things that we consider most human. Each other. And um, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Hi everyone, my name is Eileen. I'm a student from MSc Creative Computing, graduating this year. I studied architecture and landscape for undergrad and was new to coding before coming to this course. For the last two terms, I was focusing on designing open-ended game experiences. Because of my architectural background, I tend to think about creating atmospheres and interacting players spatially with the game environment in my designs. My final project is called Forest Daydream VR. It is an interactive VR experience that aims to create emotional connections of players and the virtual world, while also express concerns of the global climate emergency nowadays. It is an open-ended VR game that players can interact with game objects and build on the virtual world. So let's start with a video about how the game looks like.
The concept of this VR game came from an interactive exhibition called Forest Daydream. Our whole class involved in implementing the exhibition, led by our tutors. The exhibition created a rich and dynamic atmosphere by lighting and soundscape. The room was filled with interactive installations, and participants can press the button to trigger different weather states. The music composition by Ben Kelly, who also teaches at our Creative Computing Institute, imitate the feeling as if participants were in a rainforest. The interactive nature of the exhibition attracted a lot of kids playing with it. Also, there were participants sitting and lying in the dome in the center of the room to just appreciate the immersive calmness brought by the exhibition. This exhibition we did has a strong interactive and immersive feature, which were also the strengths of virtual reality. So then I thought, why don't I make it into a VR game to also create a pleasant interactive spatial experience? This VR version of Forest Daydream shared the same environmental considerations as the exhibition, and I also tried to interpret the features of the exhibition into a way that fits more into virtual reality. First of all, the low poly aesthetics of the exhibition was a dominant feature. The low poly trees indicating the environment imitated a forest-like atmosphere. The dark environment emotionally isolated the participants from the outer environment. Similarly, virtual reality has a sense of isolation as well, so that can more easily immerse users into the virtual world. When designing the visual characters of this VR game, I kept the character of low poly aesthetics as well as exaggerating the digital feeling of the environment. Which is to say, the VR game aimed at creating an environment that provides the enjoyment of being in the nature, but meanwhile including some absurdity in the virtual experience. Sound effects of collisions by my friend Ethan Tian also pursues an absurd feeling. I try to balance the game experience between the grabs of nature and the absurdity of having to experience the nature in such a digital way. To make the game interactions intuitive to players, the interaction system is kept simple. There are only two types of interactions in the game, teleportation and grabbing. Players move in the game space by teleportation, and all the game responses are generated by grabbing and releasing game objects. There are three main elements in the game, trees, flowers, and rocks. Each performs differently when players interact with it. Interacting with the game object results in the generation of more game objects of the same type, hence building on the richness of the space. Players are empowered to play with the game differently and craft their own world. The exhibition was outstanding in its dynamism of the environment as well. It showed the weather change of the rainforest through lighting and music composition, while the VR game uses a more realistic way. Realistic sounds of outdoor background sound, wind and rain overlaid with some music pieces we used in the exhibition with scenes of blowing leaves or raindrops convinces players of the weather in the game. Combinations of day and night, wind and rain results in the change in the environment. However, the variation in scenes still has a lot of potentials to increase, to attract players more and for a longer period in the game. I also got five playtesters who involved in the exhibition to test this VR game and to iterate the design process according to their feedback. I observed how they played the game and also interviewed them about their opinions about the game. Here are some photos of the virtual world they crafted. As you can see, the game scene aesthetics improved a lot in the iterative design process. The interactions were as well. My dissertation was about how I improved the interaction system of this game to make the game experience more engaging to players. In developing the game, I tried to interpret the key features of the exhibition in my way, but didn't emphasize on necessarily making the game resemble the physical exhibition. 
ways of interactions and approaches towards immersion were quite different, but both designs investigated on increasing engagement of participants. In terms of gaining positive emotions, although in a different way, the VR game resulted in a similar peaceful and joyful emotional impact as the exhibition. That's all of my presentation today. Hope you like it. For any more information or if you want to download a VR game, please find links below. Thank you all. Hello and welcome to my presentation about the project Bystander. Um, thank you for all coming and for taking the time to listen to what I have to say. Uh, just to let everyone know that a small disclaimer, I won't be showing or representing the game um, in this talk, just to be a bit mindful of anyone that's a bit sensitive to the topic of uh, sexual harassment and more mainly focus at the last scene of the game where it's a bit more intense. Um, however, I will leave a link uh, to a short video of a playthrough if anyone's interested. Um, so you can you can view it at your at your leisure, basically. Um, so yeah, why did I why did I decide to make a game called Bystander and why on the topic of sexual harassment awareness specific? Um, so personally, I I grew up with a bunch of women in my in my life, and I also grew up to be a complete introvert who lived in a, under a rock apparently for many years and didn't really. Um, witness any street harassment as per se, um, originally. So it was only when I kind of moved out of my, my mum's that I, I came to London. I got to know more people from different areas, different places, and know more like women from different countries and, and so on and different backgrounds. And it was only then that I actually w was made mostly aware and kind of started opening my eyes a bit. Um, to the situation at hand where there is a lot of street harassment there is a lot of sexual harassment at a ho like on a whole um so this had been kind of sat at, in the back of my head for quite a while for a good like uh three four years almost um so then eventually i, I got the opportunity to do a project on kind of with the topic of kind of marginalized um backgrounds and so on and i figured why not try this like this is perfect thing that's been sat in my head for a while I've been wanting to make a difference somewhere so then I came up with the idea of um, creating like recreating these scenarios um, which then after some conversations with my supervisor Phoenix we then came to a conclusion that it'd be more interesting from someone of my background who wasn't quite aware or has always been standing almost like as a third person perspective uh, from an outside perspective rather than directly involved in these harassments and therefore I can relate to the to the main character more which helps me recreate these scenarios way more effectively so that's exactly what I did I, fa I found that was a very interesting approach anyway um, and yeah and maybe it might help other people who might be in my situation where they're turning a blind eye or not aware of the situation to actually in involve themselves into this situation and circumstance um, and yeah it's my way of kind of doing something meaningful meaningful and dealing with a real world, world problem essentially so yeah So the whole game is essentially a bunch of like narrative choices where you have three main scenes um, starting off where you like you're obviously like a bit of backstory um, to get yourself in the mood. Essentially you're supposed to be going from one place to the next almost like just get going on about your day as if you're meeting someone or going home or just everyday things. So you're always traveling around somewhere or another, whether you're a pedestrian, a driver or, or so. From this circumstance specific, it's from a pedestrian um, journey. Uh, you're this this male who's just getting on with his 
his night, his evening, he's off to meet a friend or, or whatnot. Um, so it starts off with like social media, it's starting quite light as per se. Um, you open up your phone because you've got a notification. You then come across on a professional platform uh, that this woman's kind of being harassed almost uh, virtually by a, another individual who's being really inappropriate to the kind of platform they're on and not respecting that it's not a dating site it's not, and it's not an appropriate way to speak to a woman on these professional sites. And I think that's very important as well to be able to disclose and, and understand the difference between like what's appropriate and what's not based on context. And that's kind of what I'm challenging the player to kind of try and identify in, in the first scene, even though it's very light and very, very um, hard to tell. But if you think about it and you go about your day, you're probably more likely to come across this scenario than most. Then it moves on. After that, you then like have different choices, which the player will then uh, concern their thoughts processes on the matter. And then you'll continue your way through South Bank on the riverside and happened to come across a street harassment where this woman's just finishing up her phone call she's on her way wherever she is like minding her own business and just happens to pass through a bunch like pass by a bunch of guys on a bench and they suddenly start like wolf whistling and trying to harass like call her over in a almost like threatening manner like barging themselves into her per, like her privacy in that manner um to the point where, because she's ignored them, she's now the problem. Like, the fact that she's minding her own business makes her at fault in their eyes. Um, thus, them insulting her and so on, and trying to. And that, what I'm trying to recreate there is what actually happens in the street of like guys normally trying to call over girls or tell them they're sexy or whatever. Uh, inappropriate behavior in general and it's almost like a, a show of dominance and peacocking if, if you will um, and I'm trying to have the audience or the player understand that this could also <laughs> make a woman feel very vulnerable and victimized um, but also from the perspective of a bystander and understand that there's a chance, like myself, you wouldn't do anything about it because you're scared of getting hurt, or maybe some other people think it's their fault, like, might be silly enough to think it's the woman's fault or whatnot. So generally there's like three different paths, um, like p positive, passive, and negative, to try and understand why people don't act um, and why people process things in different ways. Um, and then eventually after this you'll you'll continue your path and you'll come across which is why I'm not displaying the gameplay in this presentation um, a physical assault even though there's no graphics um, displaying this it, there's still quite like there's the audio and and I didn't want to affect anyone in a pro like in this presentation however again I'm trying to bring the player now the choice of like do you want to intervene do you want to be the hero um which is like what i would consider the positive choice then you've got your passive choice of calling the police and then you've got your negative of running what i wanted to challenge the player here was if they did try go down the hero course i don't believe majority of us as much as we would want to have it in us to actually make that choice to to intervene, to get involved physically. Like, all of us want to be the hero. All of us want to take that, that move. But normally, and myself included, I'm pretty sure I would freeze up or I would be un incapable of doing so out of fear for my own well-being. So to challenge the way that the games industry has somewhat made players feel that they can always be the hero no matter what i decided to kind of throw that in the player's face of so being like look this is supposed to be awareness this is supposed to be a representation of real life so yes you might want to be the hero but you can't always be that hero um and yeah so here's a few 
screenshots of like different scenes. So this is the first scene and then you're progressing onto the second scene and so on. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it from Bystander as of right now. Um, I do intend to try and develop this uh, proof of concept further, uh, involve more free movement and different scenarios and consequence based on your choices. Which, and when I say consequence, I mean uh, it might adapt what scenarios happen later. You might, so say you pick up a paper leaflet for something, you throw it away, you might be locked off from other happen, like scenes happening later on, and you might be then put down a certain path. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the future for Bystander, hopefully. Thank you for watching guys, I um, really appreciate you taking the time to listen and yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna. Uh, thank you so much for joining all of us online today uh, to celebrate the end of our degree. Um, so today I'd like to um, talk a bit about my thesis project, uh, but before that I will very briefly talk about my overall creative practice um, so everyone can get like a better background context of where I'm coming from. Um, so I studied my undergraduate degree um, in BA Graphic Design, also at UAL and actually in the exact same Peckham Road campus. Um, and it was towards the end of my um, second year of BA when I undertook this uh, collaborative project with one of my amazing and super talented friends, Maria. Um, and I discovered a very strong interest in um, in experience design and front-end development. So since then I've taken a user-centric approach and placing user needs, wants, and their positive experience as the central focus for most of my um, academic, personal, external, and client projects alike. And a chunk of these have also involved um, some form of front-end development. Um, and this is also true for my thesis project, uh, which is titled Swap Meet for Plant. Um, also on a side note before I forget, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put it in the um, chat on the side um, and I'll make sure to answer them as it comes through. Um, so back to Swap. Uh, Swap is essentially a recipe website um, that helps you with your plant-based diet journey. Uh, sorry, plant-based diet cooking specifically, and this platform specifically and only shares recipes that are traditionally cooked and baked with animal products. And this is mainly to demystify the common notion that plant-based dishes are not as tasty, uh, which is a statement that I would have agreed until last year. Um, so a bit about my initial inspiration for Swap, um, it stems from my personal experience. Um, after moving in with my sister back in September of 2019, um, who has been committing, committed to living plant-based uh, for nearly three years now. Um, and it was sort of a common conversation topic for us to discuss about sustainability and animal welfare, for example, at the dinner table. Um, but I noticed that despite having learned all of these um, all of these consequences of eating animal products from her, I still found myself um, indulging in tubs of ice cream, dairy filled ice creams and um, cheese covered snacks, etc. And it was extremely difficult actually for me to give up on certain products, especially towards the beginning. Um, and I'm slowly losing these cravings, but I don't think I can call myself vegan just yet because I'm still going through this um, gradual shifting process. And um, so seeing myself struggle like this, um, I started questioning, like, what is it about animal products that makes it so appealing? Um, is, it, is it the taste or the texture? Does it depend on culture, etc.? Um, and right around the same time, I came across um, a quote by a feminist vegan advocate, um, and her name's Carol J. Adams, and I quote, um, while they, they as in vegetarians slash vegans, think that all that is necessary to make converts to vegetarianism slash veganism is to point out the numerous problems meat eating causes, in a meat eating culture none of this really matters. So 
reading this quote in her book, uh, The Sexual Politics of Meat, I saw the need to ideate alternative approaches to encourage plant-based living. And as I continued to read this book, there was one chapter um, that really caught my attention. Um, and this chapter was talking about how the condoning and further the favoring of meat, favoring of meat eating is subconsciously deep-rooted in the way meat and vegetables are represented in language. So, um, to clarify a bit more, what she meant by this is, for example, in phrases such as to get to the meat of the topic, and also the phrase a meaty discussion, meat is used as a metaphor to describe something of substantive value. Um, and also the idiom to beef up is another example in which meat um, symbolizes the key element to better a given mediocre situation. Um, but on the other hand, vegetable depicts a completely different um, image. For example, the word vegetate uh, means requiring no mental or physical activity, or in other words, lifeless. Um, and also the word potato, for example, is used to refer to a person who's inactive, dull, and unpolished. Um, so as can be seen through these examples, meat is often introduced in language to describe the dominant, better characteristics, whereas vegetables are often the opposite, and they portray more submissive characteristics. And understanding the semantics of meat and vegetables uh, in this way, I had three thoughts in mind. Um, so the first one being, um, I learned that there's this specific narrative written around meat and vegetables, and they aren't simply just food, it has all these layers of meanings attached to it. Um, and secondly, this specific language may be one of the reasons, one of the contributing factors towards our attachment to consuming animal products. And third, lastly, um, by modifying this language and rewriting this, in a way, problematic narrative, this might be the sort of alternative approach to promoting plant-based living. Um, so returning back to SWAP, the final de deliverable, the main purpose of SWAP throughout this project was that it was um, designed and built as a research tool uh, to, examining, to examine the following question, which is, what role does language play in nudging individuals towards ethical dietary choices? Um, so to conduct this research, I designed two different versions of SWAP, um, essentially, they're both very similar with the control variables of the websites being the visual interface um, and the recipes, all the recipes introduced. Um, but in version A, I used specific words and phrases that maintains this hierarchical, hierarchical gap uh, between meat and vegetables, whereas in version B, I attempted to eliminate this disparity through the language, uh, through the specific use of language. Um, also, I want to mention here that there was a lot of user research and market research and design research um, that went into the project to ideating the final deliverable, um, and I have documented all of my process um, online using Miro, so um, please feel free to check it out if you would like to. I'll leave the link here. Um, so, uh, as can be seen in, in this table, uh, the difference in language between the two versions are quite subtle, um, but you can see that it gives off contrasting connotations. Uh, so with these two versions, I conducted a, um, an A and B testing, in which I asked participants of various dietary preferences to cook one of the recipes from the website, or if they don't have the time, just uh, freely explore the platform. Um, and afterwards, I also asked them to fill in a survey, uh, which focused less on usability questions, but more so on questions around their emotional response to the language used in the website. Um, so based on my literature review, my sort of initial hypothesis was that people who access version B of SWAP would be more inclined to adopt a plant-based diet. Um, but evaluating the qualitative and qual quantitative data collected from the survey, um, the conclusion I arrived at 
was that rewriting the language around meat and vegetables alone um, has sort of minimal impact on whether that individual wants to swap to a plant-based diet or not. Um, so what I mean by this is that there was one question in the survey um, asking how likely would you start a fully vegan diet after using swap? And as you can see in the bar graphs here, um, the responses varied greatly in both version A and B. Um, and instead, in, so in the survey responses, there were more comments on the website's user interface and overall content. Um, a trend that I saw uh, was that many people described the website with adjectives such as um, approachable, friendly, uh, joyful, cute, and feminine. So this was actually one of my worries when I finished developing the graphic identity of Swap, um, that maybe the visual design is a bit too soft, and in a way, it might sort of like diminish the legitimacy of this very important weighty subject matter. But the survey responses suggested that that maybe evoking positive emotions through the visual design might actually be the core strength and uniqueness of Swap. Um, so to wrap up and summarize, while language is still an important factor that shapes our perception towards animal products versus plant-based products, um, that alone has sort of limits to the extent in which it can um, redefine our deep-rooted subconscious relationship with food, and that visual design might actually play really a really important role in nudging people towards ethical dietary choices. Um, and so as a next step, SWAP is a project that I plan to continue to develop. And um, I already have a couple of additional features and elements that I would like to modify um, and add. And the larger mission is to grow it into, grow this into a community space to support one another with our plant-based diet journey. Um, I think that's all I have for my thesis project. Um, and on an ending note, uh, thank you so much once again for joining us today. Um, and I've put up my portfolio websites, contact details, social media handles, etc., uh, which I'll just keep them on the screen for a bit. So maybe if you want, you can take a screenshot. Um, and also, if anyone finds my work um, interesting, not just swap, but anything in my uh, portfolio. And if you want to collaborate um, on a project or also hire me, since I'm still, I'm still looking for a full-time job, um, please feel free to contact me. Um, I absolutely love meeting other creatives and working on collaborative projects. Uh, so that would be amazing if I get like a message in my inbox. Um, and yes, I think I'll, I'll pass it on to Stu, who's presenting next. Um, and thank you again, um, and please enjoy the rest of the presentations. Hey there, I'm Stuart Leach. Uh, thanks for joining me and the rest of my classmates as we're walking you through what we've been working on so hard over the past six months. We really appreciate it. Uh, what I've been working on is a little project I like to call Controversy Warning. And in the spirit of warning, uh, I should give you a heads up. This is a very American-focused project. Uh, so if you're tired of all things American in 2020, or all things politics, or the combination of the two, I don't blame you. That's kind of part of my motivation for pursuing this project, in fact. So there's no art here. Feel free to go get a coffee, take a walk, come back in 12 minutes for the next person. This all started with a problem I've been having for years. Uh, a bad habit. I am too much of a news junkie. Uh, any idle moment, I'm checking the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Drudge Report. Um, but my bread and butter is, of course, the Reddit news subreddit. And I find myself just doom scrolling essentially thumbing through submission after submission, getting mad, getting mad at the people who are doing these bad things. Um, just, I don't really remember the details, I just remember the feelings, the negative impressions I have about the event and about the people, the groups of people who are making these things happen. How could they do these things? It's inhuman of them.
we would never do these things, my people, people like me, uh, it turns into a bit of a feedback loop of division and negativity and stress and tribalism. Because a lot of these articles, they, they really do tend to create a narrative of us versus them. But, of course, I'm not the only one doom-scrolling. There are millions of us, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of us doom-scrolling and getting mad and feeling divided. So it's really a societal problem. Uh, all of us, we're all just getting mad at things that we can't affect and really don't affect us all that much. It's pointless. There are problems that we can contribute to solving. Uh, and these things, they instead distract us. They divide us and they distract us. At least I try to spend time on, on sources that at least are more truthful than not. At least I like to think so. Um, but it really is just stressful. And people like me, um, who use the technology a lot more to keep up, tend to be a little bit more stressed and consider technology itself to be more stressed according to a big study uh, from a few years back before 2020 <laughs> by the American Psychological Association. But really, if this is so bad for so many people, who benefits? Who is creating these narratives? Why are they creating these narratives? Who are the sides, the groups, the tribes present in these uh, conflicts? Uh, and, and is what they're doing of benefit to us as a whole, us as individuals? Or is it just mostly to their benefit and we're just being used? Uh, the narrative is the issue. And you might have seen this, it's from a couple years back. Sinclair Broadcast Group, they own a bunch more and more of the local TV news stations in the States. Uh, and they kind of use them as propaganda platforms. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is to serve our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso Las Cruces communities. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about the trouble that is responsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media Unfortunately, some members of the media use their platforms to push their own personal bias and agenda to control exactly what people think. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. I think you get it. Uh, Sinclair is only one of a very small group of right-wing news organizations, which uh, they tend to be more imaginative than informative. Uh, Republicans tend to only trust seven news organizations compared to uh, 22 that the Democrats trust out of 30 in a research study done by Pew. Uh, this year, actually, so it's it's very up to date. Uh, so they tend to be more at risk of falling into filter bubbles, um, which is why I focus on them. And if you've ever watched any of these channels, uh, you'd know that it kind of resembles the two minutes of hate from George Orwell. I'm running short on time here, so I'm just going to give you a short little bit. That right there is the bad guy. Mm -hmm. 
now. Imagine, rather than a mere two minutes of hate, it's 24-7. And that's Fox News for you. So, my project it has been attempting to break the loop, break the doom scrolling, uh, by, well, by creating something that's usable, so it's something that can't just stay in the lab, uh, and it's not just a static study, but it's an application uh, that can accurately identify this negative, divisive content that is easy and clear, and most importantly, it reduces people's consumption of this kind of media. Uh, at this point, at this juncture, I'm focusing on divisive, controversial sorts of content. In the future, it can be expanded all kinds of different ways. And, of course, uh, I did what anyone studying computer science would do. I trained a machine learning model to recognize controversial content, and I integrated it with a Chrome extension. So, let's, s oopsies, <laughs> let's say we are visiting Reddit. Right, Reddit news. We see over here on the right, oh hey look, we might want to think twice about reading this or diving into the comments. Same with this one, Trump and coronavirus, always controversial. So, if you see this next to this, are you more or less likely to jump into an orange or a blue? Hopefully, you're more likely to avoid the content that is labeled maybe controversial. At least that's the point. Uh, this is only an initial version of what I'm working on. Uh, there's a lot of work left to do, but it's still been an interesting experiment. Uh, I trained it on 6,000 Reddit submissions from the news subreddit. Uh, I used Reddit's own controversial labeling to use a supervised learning method, which worked reasonably well. I got up to over 70% accuracy on the test set, which is pretty good, based on the uh, the text alone. If I had more details into it, I could probably get even more accurate. Uh, interestingly enough, the model thinks all advertising is controversial, but it is a bit slow. Uh, it's good enough for an MVP but definitely too slow for production. You saw when I loaded the page just how long we had to wait for the color to change and the maybe controversial text to show up. Uh, that is no good if we're going into production. Uh, but even a very simple model like this, trained on only 6,000 titles, took up two whole gigs on, uh, on disk and in memory, of course. Uh, so it is difficult finding a place to actually deploy this. But still, all, all things considered, pretty good. Uh, and in future work, I'd like to integrate this with other research uh, about fake news, about how this sort of information propagates on social media, um, and more importantly, on identifying the creation of us and them in this content and exactly who is creating these groups and to what purpose. Uh, but this is the end of my master's degree, so this this extra research, the further work, uh, it's gonna have to wait. Maybe I'll come back for a PhD or maybe I can uh, work on this in some research center or the public sector, I'm not really sure at this point. Uh, if you have an idea, please, please contact me. I love this stuff, it's great. Um, right, you can find me down here in my email, stuartleach at gmail.com.
and on my LinkedIn. And if you want to see the code for this, it's down there in my GitHub. Um, and if you want actually the link to the exact repo rather than my GitHub profile, just at me in the live box to the right, I guess. Uh, and I will give that to you forthwith. Thank you for spending this time with me. Um, I'm glad to have had your attention. <laughs> have a great day. Uh, Merry Christmas and um, happy Hanukkah, happy holidays, all that good stuff. Hello and welcome to my presentation. Today I would like to talk about the topic of my master's thesis, which is authoring interactive documents with MDX. So let's get started. So to start off, I would like to talk about text. So nowadays text has become a sort of ubiquitous medium for communicating information rather than, for example, spoken word. And this trend has especially been reinforced with the advent of computers. So to think about it, um, written word is essentially the native language of computers. So basically computers are on the one hand text processing machines and on the other hand the computer program, the native language of the computer, is essentially just text. But it's also interesting to think about the properties that uh, text in this computational medium has. So on the one hand we have the sort of traditional static text which has some of these following properties. So on the one hand, uh, the information flow goes from the text to the reader. So it's, a, it's one way. On the other hand, text, the static text is linear. So for example, think of a book, you read it from top to bottom, from front to back. And the other and thirdly, it's uh, traditional text is physical. So it's like limited by uh, in time and space. Um, well, on the other hand, dynamic text doesn't have those limitations. So on the one hand, it is interactive. So information can flow both ways from the computer to the reader, and the reader can also interact with the text, and the text can react to the information of the reader. Uh, on the other hand, text does not have to be uh, linear in this sort of dynamic medium. Think of, for example, hypertext, in which text is sort of arranged by association uh, on the other and thirdly we have text that is digital so it's not actually limited by the, uh, by the limitations of physical space it can like stretch it can uh, contract it can rearrange itself in ways which would not be physically possible so this brings us to the topic of interactive documents so inter interactive documents are this type of medium which tries to like, fully take advantage of its computational environment and to create a form of document which is richer and more engaging than traditional text uh, ways that traditional checks just cannot enable. So one way, way it does that is there is idea of interweaving code and prose. So the idea is that basically essentially source code, so the programming code and writing prose are just they're both just forms of text, so that the distinction between those two in the sort of computational medium is actually rather arbitrary. And historically, there have been many different terms uh, to describe the sort of idea of interweaving code and prose. Uh, one of the more famous ones is the idea of literate computing, which is a term coined by Donald Knuth. And the idea is basically you write your source code in such a way that you optimize it to be readable by humans. So in a sense, how this would work is when you write source code, you start by writing prose. So you start by describing what your program does and then essentially interweaving like little snippets of code, which actually are the program. So what the machine would then do is just read the text file and untangle the code from the prose and execute the code. <clears throat> a different approach, um, which is sort of on the spectrum from prose to code, falls more on this prose side. So it's this idea of explorable explanations. So this is the term coined by Brad Victor. And the idea is that basically nowadays text is sort of seen as this uh, medium for information to be transmitted, for information to be consumed. 
And the idea is that with the sort of interactive documents, with documents that live in this computational medium, we can transform documents to be something more than that, to be sort of the sort of environment to think in, to create this environment that actually sort of enhances human cognition rather than just transmitting information. So let's come back to the practical output of my master's thesis. So what I used for my thesis is this sort of format called MDX. And the idea of my thesis, my research, was uh, seeing how well this format fits for creating interactive documents. So, so what is MDX? MDX is the f it's a format for writing, for embedding JavaScript in Markdown. So Markdown is this very popular sort of syntax for writing prose nowadays. It's very uh, commonly used in technical documentation, for example. And this is very minimal, very lightweight syntax. But the problem with Markdown is that it only produces sort of static text. And the idea of MDX is that by embedding JavaScript, or more precisely JSX, which is a, a syntax extension of JavaScript, we enable uh, this writing these sorts of forms of Markdown, which have these interactive properties. So to demonstrate that and the ability of MDX to create interactive documents and to assess uh, how well MDX is suited for that, I created these sort of three prototypes, three uh, prototype interactive documents. And interestingly, this presentation itself is uh, an interactive document, it is written in MDX, and this allows me to embed some of the examples from, uh, from my prototypes in this presentation. So my first interactive document was on the topic of the Mandelbrot set, and the Mandelbrot set is a sort of object of computer graphics, which is essentially this very simple formula that produces this very beautiful, very intricate output. And the uh, concept that this interactive document demonstrates is the idea of, sort of these interactive examples. So rather than me just describing how the Mandelbrot set works in uh, just a written word, I actually provide an interactive example of what I'm explaining. And this enables the reader to get an intuitive understanding of how the system behaves. Rather than, rather than just having to sort of simulate the, the description in their heads. And so to just demonstrate that, I have one of these examples here. Um, so essentially what, a, uh, what the Mandelbrot set is, is it, it, this is uh, an iteration of a complex number. So what we have here is sort of this demonstration of uh, how a complex number looks like in the 2D plane. And this is how it sort of behaves as we iterate it. So can you just adjust the number of iterations here? And we see that for this particular n number, it converges, so it goes closer to this point. And you can drag it around and see so that it converges. And sometimes, if you go too far, it starts to diverge. And we can sort of start to feel like that there's a boundary that somewhere here it starts to diverge and somewhere here it doesn't um, get a sort of intuitive understanding that there has to be some sort of boundary and if we want to sort of visualize where this boundary lies we can do that and once we do that we can sort of see this Mandelbrot shape merge so inside it everything converges while outside it just starts to diverge Right. So this way we sort of create a uh, type of understanding which would just not be possible with static text. Um, and for the sake of time, the next examples are just going to be static images. But you can check out all the interactive documents that I produced uh, on the website and there's a link at the end of, th of the presentation. Okay. So the second type of interactive document that I produced is what I term parametric text. So the idea is that you would have the sort of text which has the ability to respond to the state of the user. So what it has is it has a slider in the top 
where you can input your attention and depending on the levels of attention you have it would either produce this very short text this very concise overview or if you have a lot of attention it would sort of expand and create this more in detail text and I find this idea to be really handy I wish a lot more uh, online media had this sort of uh, function but also if you were sort of interested in some detail points you can always like manually expand it so I think that I thought that was a pretty handy function of text. So the third example is on the concept of a digital garden. And this is a concept that has grown in popularity recently. And the idea is basically you create this sort of online space, which consists out of a lot of, lot of little nodes. And these nodes can range from somewhere between like just snippets of thought to like whole articles. And the way you would link between them is through this concept of a bidirectional link. So when a bidirectional link is, it's very similar to a hyperlink, but the um, node that is linked to is also aware of the fact that it is linked. And in the end, what you would do is you would create this sort of network graph of all the nodes and how they are connected. And you would can, can sort of visualize the connections in between, uh, between nodes like that. And what the interesting thing is, so on the one hand, your collection of nodes will sort of grow organically in this non-linear ways, but on the other hand, it can also be consumed or be read by other people uh, similarly in this sort of non-linear ways and can be explored associatively. And I think the concept is also really fascinating, really interesting. So, uh, just to give you a conclusion, I think that MDX is a really interesting, it's a really interesting type of tool. I think th that nowadays computers, they enable us to produce this very interesting, very novel and rich forms of text, but are very commonly used to just like reproduce as sort of existing and static forms of textual media. And I think or I hope that MDX can be used as a tool to, on the one hand, popularize this idea of interactive documents, and on the other hand, just make it more simple, uh, more accessible, and more approachable. Um, yeah, and that, that's it. That was my presentation. Thank you for listening. And if you want to visit the interactive documents that I produced, you can find them under this link. And if you have any questions, just post them in the chat and I'll try to answer them. Hi everyone, my name is Katerina. I'm a broadcast journalist and creative producer. And today I would like to introduce to you my final project. It's a video game called UN Road Trip. I will divide my presentation into five parts. First, I will talk a bit about the idea behind the game then about the data I used. After that I will discuss news games and feature news and my proposed merger of the two. And fourthly I will show you an extract from the game and talk about its mechanics and rules. And lastly I'll mention the challenges and what I feel could or should be improved. Now the idea for the final project developed over the summer when I read an article. This year it's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. I then researched uh, the UN's website and found a presentation they had prepared about the 75 year history. It contained text and images and I thought that there must be a more interactive way of presenting this interesting history. I conducted further research um, on whether there's data related to the anniversary freely available one question I had in mind was, considering the UN had been established to keep peace, has it been successful? Have the numbers of people dying due to war decreased since the establishment of the UN? I found data sets by the Peace Research Institute Oslo on the number of vessel deaths for 1946 to 2008 and by the Uppsala Conflict Data Program. It's part of the Uppsala University in Sweden and they captured data on the number of vessel deaths from 1989 to 2019. 
I also found information on the number of vetoes cast by the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, or P5, on proposed resolutions over the 75 years. The vetoes are also very interesting as they tend to be a strategic method or are based on keeping alliances rather than be opposed to what the resolution is actually about. I also researched for video and audio from each year that I could use, such as speech extracts or news clips in the time frame. And I found a few, but not that many. Once I had found all these sources, I then brainstormed ways of how to present them visually in an interesting, engaging, interactive way. An obvious choice for a historical overview is a sort of a timeline of some sort, but I felt that that was not enough as an experience. I needed something with which I could present those different layers of information in, a, in, in one experience. That's when I started looking at um, three-dimensional dimen ways, and in the end, a non-fiction video game or news game seemed the right format. Now, news games, according to Sikar, are a subtype of political games, which, rather than transmitting a political idea, have a goal to simulate certain aspects of news as relevant for an intended audience. An example is the news game September 12th, which was published in 2003. Now, in this game, Arab terrorists mingle with ordinary people, and the player's job is to kill terrorists without killing civilians. But no matter how carefully the player aims, there will always be collateral damage. And when that happens, lots more terrorists appear. Sikar has formulated four principles that need to be present in news games. An easy, almost universal distribution. So browser-based games are often the vehicle for news gaming. News games can have an editorial line, but they do not have political interests. They illustrate, not persuade. They participate in the public debate, illustrating news by means of procedural rhetoric, but they do not want to steer the discussion. And fourthly, they are temporal, and they do not aspire to survive longer than the news. Now, within the context of journalism and broadcasting, there is a type of news writing that is not so time-sensitive. Feature stories, or news features. Unlike straight news, Feature stories contain more creativity, are subjective, and remain informative. They also entertain the reader, and are less perishable. News features are feature stories about current events, but this does not mean that old stories are excluded. An anniversary is one of those instances in which past events become new or news. News features do not have to be based on a new event, but they need as do all news stories, a hook that connects them to current affairs. They can be in-depth analyses or portrait stories, for example, giving them longer shelf life. A combination of Sikar's four principles of news games and Williamson's five characteristics of news features could be used in game design. A merger could strive for universal distribution and news illustration but be subjective and less perishable, as well as informative, creative and entertaining. Bogost, Ferrari and Schweitzer have divided news games into several subgenres, as you can see in this graphic. The subgenre of current event games has in their definition three subtypes. Editorial games with an argument or those that attempt to persuade the players in some way. Tabloid games, a playable version of soft news particularly sport, celebrity and political gossip, and reportage games, striving to emulate factual reporting, producing the video game version of a written article or televised segment. News feature games, on the other hand, can have their own independent story based on their own independent research. Looking at Bogost, Ferrari and Schweitzer's definition of news games, News feature games would fall under the subgenre of current event games, forming a fourth subtype. An example of such a news feature game is UN Road Trip. Let's have a look at the game. 
It starts with some bullet points listing the rules and mechanics. You only have three lives, for example, and there is a time frame within which you have to complete the course. You can steer the vehicle with the four arrow keys on your keyboard. It tells the story of a blue helmet soldier sitting in a jeep and driving through 75 years of United Nations history. Now today, when victory has crowned our arm, we have to bring to the task of creating permanent conditions of peace. The same sense of urgency, the same self-sacrifice, the same willingness to subordinate sexual interests to the common good has brought us to the crisis of war. The road leads through a desert landscape, replicating the Syrian desert. From start to finish, in level 1, the road consists of 25 sections, with each section visually separated by a road sign indicating the year and a billboard with a highlight from that year. Whenever a new section is entered, an audio clip plays from the Jeep's radio, announcing news and highlights from that year. The road ascends or descends via ramps, according to the number of battle deaths that were recorded in the world that year. The amount of deaths is displayed in an SOS sign with an integrated progress bar. It indicates higher numbers in red and lower numbers in green. This is followed by exploding bombs representing the number of vetoes cast by the P5 on proposed UN resolutions that year. The explosions come in five different colours according to the P5 veto country they represent. The Soviet Union is red, China is yellow, the United Kingdom is light blue, the US is green and France is dark blue. A desert is an environment that is not crowded with plants or buildings that could distract from the billboards, bars and audio. Syria has been location of many battle deaths in recent years, which is why the terrain was modelled on the Syrian desert. The game has been divided into three levels. Goal is to create excitement in the player and the aspiration to try and finish all of them. It also breaks the extensive information down into smaller, more digestible pieces and allows adjustment of the game mechanics and the environment for level 2 and 3. Additionally, this triple division highlights the development of the P5 vetoes over the 75 years, with the Soviet Union being predominant during 1946 to 1970 with 80 vetoes, the US becoming predominant during 1971 to 1995, and the veto being a popular strategic method used by Russia, China and the US throughout the last 25 years. The game is also an attempt to express interesting dilemmas. The bombs are dangerous obstacles that could have bitter consequences. Vetoes on proposals of the Security Council have often been cast for geopolitical reasons sometimes with grave consequences. The UN and international law have, for example, struggled to constrain unacceptable attacks on innocent Palestinian civilians killed in Gaza as a result of disproportionate military action, not least because of the US veto constraining the Council's options. Equally, the, the Russian veto and its alliances with Syria have blocked any serious international peacekeeping attempts at action in Syria in recent years. The veto bombs also illustrate that the underlying dynamic of conflict is what Patterson describes as antagonists driven by mono-ethnic interests. Having a P5 system with veto rights is a self-inflicted challenge, a devil's pact. On the other hand, the game also clearly shows how the ramps over the 75 years become flatter with the road tending to move slowly downwards. In fact, since the establishment of the United Nations, the numbers of battle death has in parts decreased by over 90%, from its highest number of over 530,000 in 1950 to just over 50,000 in 2019. Now this game is a prototype and there are many components that could or should be added or amended. Here are my ideas for future improvements. First, after showing the mechanics at the start, an animation scene with a camera pan of the road from above should be added, so the player can see the actual path the road takes, creating the letters U and N.
you could also add an animation of a blue helmet soldier sitting down in the jeep and turning on the radio and starting to drive the jeep to introduce the radio and its importance in the game. You could add bars to the radio and make them move when the radio is turned on. A scene after crossing the finish line needs to be added to move to level 2. When the time ends, it needs to show game over, which it doesn't do yet. You could add an energy function to the jeep, indicating that when a bomb hits it, it loses energy. In the project, the jeep's windscreen is transparent, and the exported game at the moment is actually black, so that needs to be fixed. Joint vetoes could be maybe highlighted in some kind of way. And something I haven't covered yet is the UN's achievement of 120 colonies becoming independent over the 75 years. This should be added in some kind of way. Now, finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank my academic supervisor, Phoenix Perry, for guiding me throughout this process and for her helpful advice and her honest words. Thank you everyone for listening and I hope you enjoy playing the game. Hi, I'm Lin Xiaoji. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to show and share my final project here. Before the presentation of my final project, I want to introduce myself first. My undergraduate background is industrial design, so I always define myself as a product designer. I always I have always been very interested in user experience area. So I believe that a good design product is the interpretation of the understanding of attitudes to the world instead of just a superficial form only. So now let's go back to today's topic, my final project. Mm, the main topic of my final project is how to create internal emotions and uh, effective experiences in games. In order to explore this topic, I designed a game under the guidance of my analysis. And I also provided some resources of uh, practical experiments to verify my approach. First of all, I want to explain two questions here. The first one is that what internal ex emotion means here. In today's game market, a lot of games try to create emotions in games, but many game researchers talk about emotions that have nothing to do with cutscenes, stories, or characters but are only related to emotions, such as uh, achievement, when players clear levels. I mean, the perspective of player is like outside the game. They experience the game from the perspective of an observer. Instead, here, what I mean about internal experience internal emotion is to create emotion and the effective experiences in the way of putting players into the game. Emotions are facilitated by a relationship with a story and its characters and the player's role in that experience. And the second question is that the reason why I want to explore this topic. Mm, we all know that emotion plays a very, very important role in our daily life. It can compel people to take action and influence the decisions we make in our daily life, both small and large. So finding the connection between the emotion and the player player self in games can give more like social and uh, educational meanings to games. I mean, whether games can be a tool that lend people the abilities to comprehend themselves better, to regulate their uh, activities, to understand their motivations, and to like 
fulfill their needs. Um, in the research stage, I did a lot of analysis on the method and the principles of uh, how other people like to create emotions in games. Um, some specific analysis will not be repeated here. Uh, the conclusion is that the, the internal experience is very important uh, because players generate internal ex emotions through their internal experience with uh, perceptions, thought, behavior, and other people. Um, players will uh, respond emotionally to what they um, perceive what they think, what they do, as well as the re reaction of others. So to unlock um, the internal emotions during play really, really involves uh, the understanding how the internal experience of players can be used in design process. And I also introduce emotional design theory. Um, emotional design is a design pro approach to create uh, products that deliver um, positive experience for users. Uh, also, we all know that the starting point of this series is not for game design. Uh, the key point of emotion, emotional design is also how to deliver emotion in design. So, I decided to try to apply this theory into my game design progress. Uh, beside on all this analysis, I built the game called Choice. I want to show you all and uh, introduce it. This is the welcome page. The four icons at the bottom here are four buttons and it will have some corresponding prompt when you put your mouse on it click click it and you will enter into the corresponding emotional space i use rectangle circle and line with three basic shapes to represent three basic emotions they are fear happiness and sadness the icon at the front represents the welcome page and uh, this icon is comp composed of these three shapes, a rectangle, circle, and line. What I want to express here is that even if these are very, very basic elements, they can still form our complicated and colorful world. Similarly, these basic emotions, uh, happiness, sadness, fear, can also form very complex emotions and moods in our daily life. And it is because we have the very basic but rich emotions that we become very independent individuals. The rectangle space is fear. The emotion of fear is expressed in two constructing colors. They are red and green. Red makes people feel dangerous. It is more outstanding, especially against the contrast of green. The background uses repeated cubes to create a sense of loss. The generation of fire of fear is always accompanied by unknown and, uh, and unfamiliar. Therefore, in the flow, the feedback after the interaction must give the player a sense of unknown. Uh, the changes between the screens cannot be continuous. In these things, the player can cause instant deformation of cubes by clicking. The speed of uh, deformation will increase as the numbers of clicks increase until the cube until the cube explodes. The fear of us is like all the small cubes and the click of the mouse is like the pressure or danger given to us from the outside world. The more these negative things given to us, the more 
Titanic will, will be just like the definition of the, those small cubes will become more and more exaggerated until it explodes. The circle space is joy. For the emotion of joy, orange and uh, green are used in colors, which represent the sunlight and the life. The shape is spheroid because this kind of curve means softness and the relaxation, which gives people a feeling of fullness, fullness and the strength in emotion. The entire interaction flow describes that the feelings of joy is relaxed and the joy is hugely influential. Mm, players can click on the ball and the shear of the big ball will gradually become clear uh, so that you, we can see the reach inside. This is to express that uh, we should have the courage to open our heart, to accept others, and to show our rich heart for emotional communication with others. Mm, then there will be a lot of small balls falling from the sky and jumping constantly. When the small ball hits the big ball, it will cause the big ball to rotate. This is like after we open our heart. Uh, the happiness of others will also affect us. At the same time, we can click the small ball to trigger the small ball to jump, jump up and hit the big ball. The line space is centers. Blue is selected for the emotion of sadness. In the sense, there are various but regular straight lines to create a sense of balance, stability, and continuity. The overall flow is very, very slow. The way of interaction is slower dragging instead of faster clicking. Uh, dragging the lines makes the lines rotate very slowly, showing different light and shoulder effects. I want to express a long and a hopeless sense of sadness here. Thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Fiona. I'm here to introduce you my project, the Cube. Cube is a digital installation that allows you to take control over shapes and structures. And to have a better understanding of my project, let's start with my concept of the medium that had introduced by Marshall McLuhan in the 1960s. In 1964, Marshall McLuhan has introduced the idea the medium is the message in his book, Understanding Media. The concept was made before digital games appear and the TV were just become the main tool for people to receive information. McLuhan has then pointed out the transformation of one medium to another. Information we receive in daily life is always being adjusted when distributed to the platform. Someone's speech can be transformed into text, a book. A book, a story can be transformed into a film, a movie. The way we receive information is going from being involved in the physical world to a much more massive network, the digital world. Media content is spread widely 
throughout the global network, and each platform allows users to interact with the information. People own the rights of control to the information containers, such as a TV or radio, and they are allowed to efficiently choose what they want to see and what they want to hear. More choices have become available to them. Messages are transformed, and you cannot really say it is the original one anymore. The tendency now is not what information we have got, but what kind of platform we use to receive information. The form of presenting content is more important than the content itself, and so my concept is to visualize the media transformation, and to really visualize my project. I need to look at forms, so I have chosen minimalism as the starting point. Looking at how complex meaning can be compressed into simple shapes and colors, artists such as Piet Mondrian, who is famous by the square and lines he used in his painting to create geometric abstract art, which shift the form of traditional paintings. The Christmas tree sculpture by one or two for architecture reinterpret the original look of tree into geometric shapes. The tree is being reshaped into rectangles and lines. You can see it is presenting trees, but the form itself is changed already. The exhibition, what a laughing and beautiful world by Tim Lab, reshaped the room as a canvas. For the projection and allow people to interact with it and change the piece together. Games such as the Marriage by Rob Humble represent marriage by using squares and circles. He used the squares to represent as the wife and husband within the art game, and interact by the players. Their interaction forms the message of marriage. By looking into games, art. Architecture and exhibition, different kinds of meanings and messages are implied into shapes. The shapes as the platform to present content, but also they become the content at the same time. After research and brainstorming, it comes to prototype. I always wonder what we can do or have experienced with simple shape. Where lots of imagination can be brought out with one form. So after the research and to break begin with my project, I made prototype of cubes. Twenty seven little cubes are made to build one large cube, and I play with these particles to see what can be expanded through these cubes. I split the cube into three equivalent parts and build some abstract forms. With nine cubes each, with only one direction and angle, those three parts can reform the shape of a cube. In another way, they build up more abstract forms that no one can realize they used to be a cube. After finish prototyping, I start building my concept digitally in Blender. Transforming the cube experience in a virtual space. The idea for my project is still quite loose at this point. So before producing my interactive piece in Unity 3D, firstly I build the conceptual design of the environment in Blender, and the experiments about lightings and position of the model. I still present my force of media transformation within my production. The models of cube will be the form of transmitting media, and more visuals will be mapped on top as the message to spread. Using Unity 3D could save my time in making projection of objects, as I only need to do it with the material, and insert research within the material. To make my 3D models interactive, the models are imported into Unity 3D, and all functions will be created here and filled with video materials. 
in order to achieve the model's transformation effect. I decided to use the animation function in Unity 3D, which you can quickly create a different structure of the models and save them to a list. An in-between transformation will be generated when the animation is triggered between one and other. The concept is used to make changes to the cube model when players interact with the piece using a mouse only one button click is needed for the function, which is simple and all the build transformation will add as an installation in the virtual space. After a list of animation is created, it comes to the point where I need to make a trigger point when mouse is clicked and form the transformation from one cube structure to all other abstract shapes. The bouncing is a transition effect. When players interact with it, the combination of the models change and form new shapes along with new texture. The models are being recreated using ProBuilder inside Unity as the UV mapping is not allowed with the important models. Rebuilding the models allows the mode of texture to fit more with my concept. The textures are the information and are being transformed by the change of models. By making lists of 2D animations, the texture itself will change randomly while the structure of models is changed. As the concept of my project is to express the transformation of media, the audience won't be able to see a complete look of the content, as the content is revised by others already. Contents are reinterpreted by the people who edit or by the platform. Hence, when players interact with the 3D models and change the structure, the texture that map on top change as well. The animation clips are therefore cut and slide into fragments along with the transformation of forms. An array of video clips is created for the video player and the animations are made using different softwares are then placed into it. Software such as After Effects and Clip Studio Paint are used to create animation textures. They are produced in minimalist style, which connects to my early brainstorming of a simple shapes and structure. Randomization is also applied in changing video clips while the shape is changing. It is to emphasize the idea of media transformation and highlight the research I made in my thesis. We have the control right to choose what to receive, but the chosen piece of information is already something decided by others before presenting to us. Thank you for watching my presentation. To try the game, you can go to itch.io to download, Windows only. And to see my previous work, go to my personal website or follow me on Instagram. Thank you.